I'm going to attempt a brief explanation of why and how demographers seek to make forecasts. There's nothing new about this. People have been trying to predict the future since the antiquity. I'm going to give you a quick tutorial on projections, with some examples of past failures, and the methods we use today. Forecasting is inseparable from the development of demography. We can see this in two classic areas, mortality and fertility, but especially mortality, since it was as early as the 17th and 18th centuries that, with the development of actuarial science, interest in projecting mortality grew. Actuarial science is the management of life insurance and life annuities, which are based on our ability to determine a fair interest rate for those products. And that depends on the frequency of deaths in the future, i.e. on life tables. The calculation of life tables interested eminent scientists such as Halley, Benoit and Departieu to give you an idea of their caliber. In a sense, fertility is more intuitive, because counting the number of births tells us how many people will be added to the bottom layer of the age pyramid, which enables us to predict the size of the population at every subsequent age and the overall population trend. First, I would like to clarify a point of terminology. Demographers prefer the term projection to forecast. Why? Because what we are attempting to determine are possible trends in the population under conditions we set for mortality, fertility and migration. And those conditions can be divided into two kinds. Conditions that seem the most reasonable, based on what we know of past trends, the current situation, and comparison with other countries, and what-if conditions, which we use to illustrate alternative scenarios which are extreme or unrealistic. For example, what if fertility or mortality were to stop? What would the consequences be? So how do we make projections? There are several requirements. First of all, this may seem obvious, but it's not, we need reliable data. We need data on the initial population, broken down by sex and age, which we usually obtain from censuses. We also need data on the initial levels of mortality, fertility and immigration, because as we shall see, that is what we project first. We obtain those data from civil records, the census or surveys. We need a starting point to know where we are going, which is not always easy. Many countries do not have reliable data on their populations. There are also examples of major adjustments, such as after the 1953 census in China. The United Nations, which had just started making projections, corrected China's population by 20%. More recently, in Nigeria in 1991, the census led to a 30% decrease in the country's population. So watch out, Gilles Pison, for your projection of Nigeria's population in a hundred years' time. In fact, we never know the exact population of any country. We can estimate the French population to within 2%. But 2% is not small and can lead to errors when we start projecting into the future. Next, we need to calculate the possible trends in these parameters. How? For world projections, we apply the basic paradigm of the demographic transition, where mortality, followed by fertility, starts falling from initially high levels to much lower ones. That trend is spreading across the world. But we have to adapt that paradigm in line with the specific experiences and context of each country. So it is only a rough guide. Next, we need a good methodology. How do we make projections? I'll come back to that shortly, but basically the cohort component method has replaced what was done in the past, which were extrapolations of the total population based on an assumption of either exponential growth or, as we shall see, a logistic function. With the cohort component method, we now project numbers for each age group. 
making up an age pyramid. We make each cohort age so that the people who are 31 now will be 32 next year. Aging is one of the basic laws of demography. Next, we add births to form the bottom layer of the pyramid, i.e. unborn babies who will be less than a year old next year. That's more complicated. Then we need to make assumptions about migration, which is often overlooked. And lastly, we need to choose a horizon. 30 years, 100 years, 300 years, as the United Nations did until recently? How do demographers think they can make such long-term projections? Well, forget 300 years, but why even 50 or 100 years? The basic answer is that, fortunately for us, population inertia is high. Let's look at the parameters again. Regarding mortality, life expectancy changes fairly slowly and steadily. That said, the decline in mortality in both developed and developing countries has been underestimated in all the projections of recent decades. We have trouble accepting that life expectancy could reach levels we have never experienced before. There are also accidents. But accidents have to be extreme to have a lasting impact on population growth. The HIV-AIDS epidemic, for example, is one of the most severe accidents of our time, causing tens of millions of deaths, mainly in Africa. However, despite this death toll, it will barely have an impact on the total population trend of the African continent, and even less on the world population trend. With respect to fertility, things are a little more complicated. Projecting fertility to 25 or 30 years means estimating the number of births over the next 25 or 30 years. What does that depend on? On the women who will be able to have children during those years. We are on fairly firm ground there because we are considering females who have already been born. But we have to estimate how many children each woman will want and will have, which is not so easy. And if we want to project fertility to 50 years, we will need to estimate the fertility of those women's daughters, i.e. based on the number of births already projected. We are in the second and third generation of the projection, in other words, trying to estimate our great-grandchildren's fertility. We still have trouble predicting trend reversals, which is not unique to demography. For example, we did not foresee either the start or the end of the baby boom. Now we have trouble knowing the future direction of fertility in countries where it has fallen below two children per woman. Will it remain at 1.4, 1.5 or 1.6 children per woman? Or will it rise again to two or even more? We have little information on which to base our assumptions and projections. With respect to migration, I don't need to tell you in the current context that the task is increasingly complex. When the rate of natural population increases zero or negative, growth depends entirely on migration, which is already the case in a number of European countries. So to conclude this section, out to 30 years, we assume that we are on fairly solid ground and can make population projections with some certainty. But beyond that, out to 40 or 50 years, our assumptions are much shakier. A tiny deviation in fertility, for example, will have a huge impact. If you add half a child to average fertility, demographers cut children into pieces, as you know, the population will explode. If you take off half a child, the population can disappear. So when we make long-term projections beyond a certain date, such as 50 years, we usually fix our fertility and mortality assumptions at levels that will maintain population growth close to zero in order to avoid that population explosion. Of course, that means the projection is not all that useful beyond the date when the parameters are fixed.
I promised you a few historical examples. I identify three main stages. The first demographers calculated simple extrapolations of the total population, or the rate of increase. There is the famous example of Malthus and his exponential growth model. But there was not much justification behind those approaches, so I won't say any more about them. We can also apply mathematical functions. One idea adopted early on by various demographers was logistic population growth. Instead of exponential growth, i.e. a population that increases indefinitely, it was assumed that beyond a certain point, the population would stop growing. In the 1830s, Coutelet and Verhulst proposed applying this logistic function to population growth. This is also known as a self-limiting model, because after growing exponentially, at a certain point the population levels off. I will give you an example of its use by the American biologist Raymond Pearl in the 1920s. However, I should stress that the choice of this function is arbitrary and does not always work, as we shall see. The main disadvantage of logistic approaches is that they do not tell us anything about mortality and fertility trends, which are either necessary to obtain the result, i.e. a rate of increase of X percent, or implied by our assumption about the rate of increase. For example, a natural rate of increase of 5 percent is impossible in a human population. Therefore, we need to find a way to limit our assumptions. This is what led us to the cohort component method in the 1930s and 1940s. At that time, people were very interested in the concept of reproduction, i.e. how one generation replaces another, which was not easy to calculate. It was also the time when Lotka and Dublin came up with their stable population theory. The cohort component method was systematized by the United Nations in 1958. But let's first look at Raymond Pearl's use of the logistic function. This approach was largely inspired by observations of plant and animal populations. Here is the trend in a population of fruit flies, those tiny insects beloved of geneticists. Scientists put them in a half-pint milk bottle and watch the population growth. The little circles represent the population size observed after a certain number of days. We observe asymptotic stability at 212. In other words, there will never be more than 212 fruit flies in the jar, even after several months. Scientists decided to apply the same function to human populations. Raymond Pearl took the population of the United States. He knew the actual population figure until 1920, which is represented by the solid line of the curve. He applied his logistic function to that trend, and his extrapolation is represented by the dotted line of the curve. He concluded that the U.S. population would reach a limit of 197,274,000 at some point between 2080 and 2100. Now let's look at how things actually turned out. I added the actual trend above Pearl's curve in red. As you can see, in 2015, the US population is 317 million, compared with not even 200 million calculated by the logistic function. Pearl's calculation was not based on any assumptions, so it's not surprising that it didn't work. Human populations do not obey such simple mechanical laws. Most of the projections made before 1945, like that one, strongly underestimated the population in 1970, 1980 or 2000. At the time, projections did not go much further into the future than that. The main reason for the failure is that, in the 1930s, the birth rate had been falling in many industrialized countries for several decades. In France, there were some years when deaths outnumbered births, and people did not see many reasons for the decline to spontaneously stop. 
In The Demographic Revolution, Adolf Landry formalized the idea that population growth had geared down and that fertility levels would probably remain low. But we know what happened next. The spectacular reversal of the 1940s, the baby boom, especially just after the war. Some thought that it would be temporary, but no one had predicted it, so no one knew when it would end either. That sudden reversal of the trend, which we still can't explain, so we can excuse the authors of the time for not having predicted it, rendered all those projections obsolete. So what of current practice? Projections are made at different levels. National statistics offices make national projections. I should mention that INED never made any real projections. Projections were left to INSEE, which has the tools, mainly the census. The most recent are from 2010 and go out to 2060. At the European level, Eurostat makes regular projections. The most recent are from 2013 and go out to 2080. At the international level, the United Nations Population Division has a virtual monopoly and releases world population prospects every two years. The most recent came out at the end of July 2015 and go out to 2100. Other organizations have also started making projections. The most interesting are those by the IIASA in Vienna, which produced projections in 1996 and 2015. I will say a word about those. The projection results are generally presented as a central, medium or median scenario, and either two or four framing scenarios. Although it is not usually stated explicitly, the central scenario is regarded as the most likely. The alternative scenarios are intended to chart possible deviations in case we are slightly wrong about the trend. In United Nations projections, the assumptions are made and applied country by country. The UN projections are done country by country and are not an overall projection of the world population. They are an aggregate of the projections for 190 or 200 countries. The assumptions are based on input from experts. The recent novelty is an attempt to construct confidence intervals scientifically using a probabilistic approach. That is what IIASA did in 1996 and what the United Nations has now been doing since 2012. Instead of deciding on the most likely trajectory of fertility, for example, with a lower and upper value, Uncertainty is incorporated into the construction of the central hypothesis. That uncertainty is based on past trends observed in similar countries. With that inbuilt uncertainty, the best projection is constructed in terms of the expected value, and a confidence interval that meets statistical standards can be deduced. The approach is debated, but that is the most recent development in projections. Of course, we must continually ask ourselves about the quality of projections. There is a paradox. Quality is often lower at national level than at continental or global level, even when the initial data are good. Why? Firstly, because at the multinational level, errors can cancel each other out. A slight underestimation in China plus an overestimation in Nigeria can more or less even out. Secondly, on a smaller scale, migration may exceed the natural increase, and migration is extremely hard to predict. Thirdly, if you are doing population projections for the French regions, for example, you cannot estimate migration to each region in isolation. You have to ensure overall consistency. By definition, internal migration has to equal zero at national level, just as inbound and outbound migration cancel each other out at the global level. Since that is extremely difficult to do, it is rarely done. To give an example, let's look at the successive projections of the French population for 2020. 
We are not quite there yet, but that is the nearest projection date to now I could find. In 1979, INSEE projected a range of 55 million to 61 million for the French population in 2020. There was no central scenario. Since 1979, that estimate has been consistently revised upwards to the current projection of 66 million for 2020. Why? Because we have almost always underestimated the trend in fertility. We have not been able to accept the idea that fertility might go up slightly when it starts to get a bit low. We have also underestimated migration and life expectancy, as I said earlier. Since the assumptions about all three components were underestimated, the result is an underestimation of the total population. Now I have a chart of the United Nations projections, which is a little more complex. This is the last thing I will show you. The x-axis shows the base year of the projection, starting in 1950, the date of the first UN projection. Each curve represents the values of the projected population for 1980, 2000, 2025, 2050 and 2100 and stops when we reach the projected date. The curve of projections for 1980 stops in 1980 because the actual population is known then. Let's take the year 2000. Projections for 2000 began in 1956. There may be a slight effect of scale here, but we can see that the projections were not wrong. First, there was a slight underestimation, then an overestimation, but overall the central scenario was not far off the mark. Those trends are accentuated for 2025. And for 2050, the second curve from the top in black, you can see that the United Nations probably, I say probably because we are not yet in 2050, strongly overestimated their initial projections in the 1970s, then revised them downwards, then slightly upwards, and then downwards again. And since about 2000, the successive revisions have always been upwards, but still remain below the 1970s levels. I think the United Nations projections are quite reasonable. They are continuously adjusted as new data become available. As Wilmot said in the film, we must continuously enrich and rectify our data and work to improve our projection techniques and assumptions. To conclude, I think we will always need to make projections, preferably good projections, at the national level, at the sub-national level, even if that is more difficult, there is high demand, and of course, at the international level. We have good enough tools to project fairly accurately to 30 or even 50 years. Beyond that, we have to consider our assumptions carefully and have them firmly in mind whenever we comment on the trend in the world population to a particular horizon, especially our fertility and mortality assumptions. According to the most recent projections, the world population will stabilize at about 11 billion, but probably not before the end of the 21st century. There are 7.4 billion of us now. But there is a major exception, Africa, whose population could continue to grow. The trend in Africa does not fit known patterns of demographic transition. So we need to pay more attention to Africa in our projections. Thank you for your attention.